Hello everyone, David Coleman, director of the Whitliff Collections at Texas State University, and welcome back to Whitliff Wednesdays. As we enter the month of August, we wanna remind you that we are open. There's lots of great stuff to see. So please go to our website and reserve your free parking spot today. For this episode of Whitliff Wednesday, we turn to the Texas Music Collection. Curator Hector Saldana has a conversation with Cam King, founder of The Explosives, a band which played a major role in the career of the late great Rocky Erickson. Here's Hector with the story. Thank you, David. Rocky Erickson continues to fascinate us. Austin's most famous psychedelic rocker who died in May 2019 is back in the news. There's an all-star tribute album out right now, produced by Bill Bentley, that's making quite a splash. Now, there is a part of the story that many may not be familiar with, there was a great new wave rock trio out of Austin called The Explosives. And The Explosives played a critical role in Rocky Erickson's comeback in the late 70s, as well as around 2005, 2006. Charles King, who was known as Cam King to his friends, was the group's unofficial historian. He's trained in the fine arts with photography. He was a poster maker for the group as well as their lead guitarist. Thanks to the Charles King collection here at the Whitliff, we can learn more about Rocky Erickson and the explosives. Freddie approached me in Austin, uh, just appeared out of the blue, and I looked at him and I said, wow, you got a haircut. And he said, yeah, I wanna do a band. And I went, great, he's already one of my favorite drummers. The original explosives were me, uh, Freddie Steady Kirch, uh, Waller and uh, Reese Winans. Freddie got the name off a bowling shirt. In the Whitliff collections, you see at the back page of our first uh, promotional uh, press kit, uh, you see a fist on a shoulder, and that's the bowling shirt with the explosives and script that, that got Freddie the name. Rocky, by the mid 70s, is a bit of a casualty, but coming back. It's, he goes to San Francisco, records with Bleeb Alien, but then he brings that material and himself back to Texas. He wants to work in Texas again, and that's where it sort of dovetailed into the explosives. And then Freddie tells me, we've got a chance to play with Rock Erickson, and between me and Freddie, in that moment, there was hesitation on my part, because why do we need to play with Rocky Erickson when he's obviously had all this trouble and we've got this momentum? I didn't dig in my heels or anything, but through general discussion, it was decided that it would not hurt, of course, to work up some of Rocky's material and play with him and see how it went. And it, it went great. I played You're Gonna Miss Me when I was in high school in my cover band. So for me to play with Rocky when in 79, when the introdu introductions were made, was fantastic. But as long as Rocky worked with the explosives, we treated him like a fourth member of the band. And he appreciated that because I don't think anybody had treated Rocky like a normal person since he was at Rusk. For us, Rocky was great music, great writer, let's play. I would say from Rocky's standpoint, uh, we seemed like a good prospect because we had a very strong following and we were a progressive band. We weren't living in the past or something. And Rocky didn't want to rest on his laurels. He wanted to do stuff. We had a good following, but we didn't have a rabid following. And these people were rabid. When we played uh, Denmark in, uh, in 2008, I mean, there were 40,000 people in this festival at Roskilde. And uh, when we finished uh, the set, you know, all these Vikings are going, whoa, they're, they're all singing the wind and more. I believe it was 20 minutes before the next band could go on, and Rocky had to go out and thank everybody and wave. We could see other people trying to get close to Rocky. We, uh, playing Raul's, we uh, slapped hands away from Rocky while they tried to pass him LSD. People were trying to pass drugs to Rocky at gigs. They wanted the Rocky of their dreams, you know? And we just wanted Rocky to have fun, play music. And it was a little daunting. And that's when I first realized you have to form a phalanx around Rocky when you walk through a crowd because people tried to sleep in blotter acid and things like this. People wanted Rocky, the, the old Rocky. Come on, man, let's trip together. The high points of the explosives with Rocky are from our inception, basically 1979 through 1982, close to th three years. Um, in 1982, 
Uh, Rocky, I believe, decided to stop taking the medication that had kept him level. Uh, this is a real problem with creative minds and, and, and that type of uh, medication is because they feel that they're being uh, lobotomized. They, they feel like they can't reach their full potential. Well, of course, this means that the leveling agent is gone and you go up, down, side, you're, you become out of control. And Rocky became actually quite hostile. What's the matter, Rocky? I see blood, man. I'm going, okay, well, let's, let's just get through this rehearsal. So Rocky's got his meds. The explosives are done with Rocky. And for the next 15 years, uh, Rocky spirals. His brother, Sumner, of course, uh, got him on the track again and straightened him up. And so about 2005, 2006, uh, Freddie calls me again, says, guess who's back in the picture? I said, who? And you know, Rocky. And I'm going, oh my God. And then I think our first gig with Rocky was uh, uh, down was on Sixth Street, I think. And Rocky just walked up to me out of the sidewalk and said, "Hey, Cam!" You know, like he didn't even know my name when we when we stopped years before. And it was amazing to see Rocky smiling and having call me by name. And I'm going, "This is going to be good." When we played the Rocky Ice Cream Socials at uh, Threadgills, and Billy Gibbons finally came on board, things were great with Rocky. And then 2008, the same thing happened. Rocky went off his meds and, and became unstable. And um, we saw the writing on the wall. We had ideas for future projects and everything like that. But at this point, Rocky was moving off in different directions. So, but we've got the longest tenure playing with this guy. Listen, when you got a band called the Explosives, I mean, you can't help but be good for Rocky. <laughs> I'm really grateful to the Whitliff for accepting this material because this is not the stuff that you can pass down to, to nieces and nephews and grandkids unless they are fanatics. Even if it's a peripheral view, it's a, it's a lucid, focused view of a certain time in our culture. And, and for the historian, I think as a peripheral player, I provide that type of stuff that you don't get from the mainstream. If, if you keep just looking at the, the collections or the records of the, the famous people, the, then you get this image, but you don't really get the full picture.